great. His life journey has taken him from being voted least likely to succeed in high school through winning the 1984 NTC Mr. Georgia competition and other various events, through an education as a chiropractor, a bodybuilder at, at Gold's Gym, and a wrestling partnership with Steve Sting Gordon. A stick with the World Class Championship Wrestling in Dallas helped him flesh out the, uh, the character that would forever make him a household name and icon. The Ultimate Warrior, as the Ultimate was, Warrior moved east to move with Vince McMahon and WWF. Within two years of headlining the Federation, he defeated Hulk Hogan for the championship belt. <laughs> the challenge that he was destined to learn, it is never wrong to fight for what is right. Never. Inspired by his personal and professional circumstances, Warrior rechanneled his physical intensity into his intellectual pursuits. Reading, learning, and writing became his new workout. <laughs> Currently, Warrior is preparing for his greatest battle, to teach, lecture, and mentor those seeking truth and leadership as human beings. Now we're going to have a short video uh, followed by our speaker.
everything you have lived to take what we both believe in to places it shall never have been. Seriously. Through the silliness, I will agree with you, I will go there with you, through the silliness of a professional wrestling career and a character that I created and performed and gave the blueprint to, I got to understand the power there is in being a role model for young minds. I'll never forget the first time that it hit me. We used to work with Make-A-Wish kids. Of course, when I was on the road professional wrestling, I was on the road 325 days a year. For about five or six years, I slept five, three to five hours a night, got what I could, gave everything I had to succeeding in professional wrestling, and really just had a discipline and behaved with blinders on. But they brought this Make-A-Wish kid to Albany, New York. And I can still in my mind see the room that I walked in to meet this kid for the very first time, the first Make-A-Wish kid I met. If you don't know anything about Make-A-Wish, it's about young kids that have terminal, they're terminally ill, and they have one wish, to either meet somebody, get a bicycle, get a car, go to Disneyland, go to the playground, something like that. I walked in that room, I had my gear on, I was going to perform later that evening. I got down on one knee to get eye to eye with the kid in a wheelchair, and when I lifted my head to look into his eyes, the lights were just right. And what I had reflected back to me in the pool of his eye was my own painted face. It hit me then, and it never left me. And during my career, I continued to build on that. Even going back to the, to clear back to the early 90s and with my match with Hulk Hogan. When I got in professional wrestling, it was a goal for me. I wasn't second or third generation. I wasn't second or third. Can you still have me back there? Yes. Anybody say yes? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, most of the guys I worked with are second and third generation. Their grandpas and their dads had been in it. When I got in it, I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, and Atlanta, Georgia was, was a hotbed for professional wrestling. I was bodybuilding at the time. I wanted to be a professional bodybuilder. I was in huge debt with my school loans, and because I was going to school in Atlanta, and I was in and out of the gyms down there, I was succeeding in amateur bodybuilding, somebody asked me if I wanted to get in pro wrestling. And I was in there like everybody else. I said, yeah, people are on TV, make money. So I'll go do that for a while, then I'll come back and I'll open my chiropractic business. Long story short, I couldn't even afford to get back to school. I paid dues, eventually things panned out. But when I got into business, it was a goal for me. It wasn't to get into professional wrestling and continue to stay in professional wrestling. I get bashed about that more than anybody else. Like I'm disrespecting the business for not being it anymore. I think there are different stages of your life, Mike, the stages of the life that I'm at now, 45-year-old man, where you are at your, your stage of life now, where you will be 10 years from now, they should always be different. You should always be wanting to challenge yourself in life. But that's not, uh, that's not an acceptable thought to most people out there. You will find that when you get out of school and you learn your studies to you go out and start making a paycheck, the ten years down the road, nobody will believe if you tell them you want to do something different. They'll say you're nuts, that you need to stick with what you're doing. Well, I'm glad from the time that I was a little kid and I had my first meeting with a high school counselor. Accidentally one day I walked into the weight room of my high school. I was a skinny little kid, man. Maybe 135 pounds. One of my mom's friends used to say to me, where's your ass? I didn't have an ass. <laughs> it was flat, like an ironing board. And I stumbled into the weight room one day, and there was an old, rusty universal weight machine. None of this fancy stuff like they have today. An old, rusty one. I made friends with that weight machine. And that friendship changed my life. That friendship changed my life. I became self-motivated. I developed self-discipline. I thought differently about myself than everybody I grew up around thought about me. And I knew I could change the direction of my life in other ways. And ever since that time, a couple of months after that, after I started getting a little bit of ass, on myself that is, <laughs> I got bold enough to think when I had the bathroom door locked and my brothers and sisters were locked outside once again and I was in there flexing my scrawny little muscles. I got bold enough to think that I could change the direction of my life in other ways and I set myself on an educational goal to become a doctor of chiropractic. And all the way through my wrestling career, I never stopped to ask anybody, can I do this? Can I do this? The major reason why was because and I was headed there and I got sidetracked. So I had a meeting with the high school counselor when I wanted to better my life through education. And I walked in there and I had this reputation for being the wrong kid in the wrong place at the wrong time. Always first I was there. Nothing serious. Just adolescent stuff. And I go in there and I say, what about Ed? Before I got, uh, what about further Ed? Before I got education out of my mouth, she closed her calendar. She says, let me tell you something, honey. She says, this summer, you make sure you go down to the factory. Most people in Indiana where I grew up, they worked in the factories out in the other bigger towns, 25, 30 miles away. She said, you make sure you get down to the factory. You put an application in. And you work there this summer. That way, when you get out of school next year, you can be sure and have a full-time job. Well, I was too skinny to even respond to that, but I left there asking myself over and over and over, how is it she could determine that about me? Not one time in 12 years of school, not one time did I ever go to a classroom door and somebody stop me and say, we don't think you have what it takes to learn what we're teaching in this in this classroom. 
So how was it she could know that I couldn't learn any more if I wanted to, if I wanted to make the effort, if I had the ambition to? And I've used that thinking throughout my whole life, and I've never been embarrassed about it. There are a lot of things I'm going to say to you tonight. That's one thing for sure that you should take with you. You can imagine a guy that does Ultimate Warrior has got a lot of energy. Generally what happens, you take a Clint Eastwood, you take an Arnold Schwarzenegger, you take female actors and stuff. It doesn't matter what characters they play, it doesn't matter what movies they're in, they always bring something of themselves into the movies. It's a distinct identity. Professional wrestling is like that. Most of the guys in the ring are just an amped up version of who they are outside the ring. I've been intense about everything my whole life. Ultimate Warrior was just an in the ring manifestation of that. And when I had my fallouts with McMahon, I got on with my life and left and never looked back and said that would be a great chapter in my life, but I think I can go on and do other things. I don't have any doubts about that. I took all that energy and I put it into reading and learning. <coughs> and I started, I guess Ultimate Warrior wouldn't start with any other book. I started with the book, How to Read a Book. How to Read a Book. Not because I couldn't read. I could read. See Jack and Jill go up the hill. <laughs> I could do the heavens and the gods thing. No, because I wanted to absorb the knowledge from the books that I was reading, the interest that I was developing. Maybe naturally. I was in my own, I was in my early thirties. Maybe I, maybe my interest was just starting to change. But through that book. I got turned on to the great books of the Western world. How many in here know about those books? Raise your hands. Come on, man. Participation. Great books of the Western world. All the great literature. Truly. I thought, man, these are ultimate thinkers. They are the people that sat and figured out what life is, thought about it, without all the distractions like you have, how many more tunes you can put on your iPod, how many more websites you can visit, how many more restaurants or beers you can check out. And they became warriors to me. And as I paid greater attention to that reading and learning, I started to pay more attention to what was going on in our culture. And another thing happened to me. Throughout my whole life, I never have had a mentor. My dad left when I was 12 years old, never to look back to find any financial support or any other kind. He blew his life on women, fast living, promiscuity. I know every single day he regretted it. But he died a few years ago at a young age because he blew his life. And I've been influenced by people throughout my life in a powerful way. Football coach when I was in high school, some other people along the way, but I never had a mentor. When I got out and I started reading the great books of the Western world, I also got interested in American history and the founding fathers, the founding people, the founding times became the absolute heroic role models for me. A lot of people will just say the Founding Fathers. Yes, the Founding Fathers. But the Founding People and the Founding Times became the absolute heroic role models for me. Their stories and the sacrifices they made and the courage they had so that we could have our comfortable and our convenient lives every day, it's incredible. It's incredible. Now I took that learning and I started going out to schools and colleges with a real simple message. You want power in your life? Use your mind. Power in your life comes from using your mind, not your muscle. What better guy to talk about something like that to little bitty kids? Show them a video, Ultimate Warrior, and then say, you know what, you want power in your life? Use your mind, not your muscle. In my own wrestling career, that's exactly what I did. I beat every one of them because I looked at the business, I used my head to be more creative, and I used the knowledge I had about my body to make my body better than anybody else's. But when I went out to a couple colleges the first time and I wanted to talk about Aristotle and A equals A, 
the human being is the rational animal. All I got was these glazed over stares from these college students. And I thought, here I am, just a dumbass, muscle headed wrestler. These college students are going to go out and be the leaders in the world. They don't want to talk about serious ideas. They don't want to know if wrestling is real or fake. That bothered me. It bothered me because I had stopped operating with blinders on in my life. And I started interacting with regular people working nine to five. I opened up some health clubs. And every day I went in. Exercise had been good to me in my life. It made the quality of my life better. It wasn't about squatting 500 pounds, bench pressing 500 pounds. It was about just getting exercise. It makes your life better. Every day, I would stand across the counter at my gym and I would listen to people whine and complain and bitch about their life. I was in my mid-30s by then and I could not believe it. I thought, I was always looking behind me like there was going to be a guy pop up and say, this is Candy Cameron. People talked like they were puppets. I was always looking for the strings. Eventually I got around to the place where I said, where's your strings? Where's the strings on you? Where's the, who's the grand puppeteer that's operating your life? They didn't believe that hard work, consistency, perseverance, working hard at what you did, finding something that you love to do and doing it well, they didn't believe any of that had anything to do with success in life. Most people felt without any logical explanation whatsoever that their lives were not up to them. And I didn't get that. And I met the woman that would become my wife. When we started talking about having a family, I said, I gotta get out there and I gotta use what I used to do to talk about serious ideas. So I'm here to talk about some serious ideas with you. At the end of the night, the question and answer, I will stay as long as the group that brought me in will let me. You can ask me any questions you want to ask me. You can ask me about wrestling. You can ask me, who's your toughest opponent? <laughs> you can ask me all that stuff. But right now, I want to talk. For the next half hour, 40 minutes, I want to talk about serious stuff. Not that wrestling, yeah, I mean, not that I didn't take wrestling serious. Now, when I go out and talk, I don't know how I've been advertised this evening. A lot of people get the misconception that I'm here just to talk about politics. I don't talk politics. If you want to ask me about politics, Dean, and I'll talk politics with you, but I don't do current news. Current news isn't going to make the world a better place for my kids to grow up in. Out in New Mexico, where I live, up to my fence line of my property, my babies are safe. Anything threatens them in any way, I'm going to seize it. But one of these days they're going to grow up and they're going to go beyond there. And I'm not cool with the way people are behaving and thinking and acting. Especially people my age. I think that when you grow up, when you grow up, you should think and act like it. So I go out and I talk about how you should live your life in a philosophy. How many in here have heard of Ayn Rand? Read some of her stuff. Good. I want to, got a quote from her. Before I start, I want to say this. How many people in here are Republican or conservative, and if they were asked to explain it, they could? Okay, come on, it's audience participation. I'm not going to call anybody out. How many in here are liberal or Democrat, and if they were asked to explain it, they could? How many people aren't just, that aren't paying attention? You hear the terms, but you're not paying attention. Well, a lot of people didn't raise their hand. At all. On any one of them. It's not uh, nothing wrong with saying that you're not listening. The problem that you run into, on both sides of the aisle, just as they, you know, platitudinously say, there are shameless, sycophantic sellouts with jelly spines and mush minds. There's scumbags on each side of the political aisle. All the way around. I'm a conservative. I can tell you later how I define that. But my conservatism supersedes my republicanism. George Bush is not a conservative. I'm not in agreement with the lot that he's done. So if you're here 
And you're waiting until the end of the night to jump on my back and attack me because you're a Republican and you support George Bush and I'm a liberal. It's not going to work because we would probably have a lot in common. Or agree, not in common. <laughs> I'm going to point that stuff out, but I would probably agree with you on a lot of stuff. I'm not carrying water for anybody. I think for myself. And those of you that haven't been paying attention, I want you to leave here tonight with some small seeds planted so that you can go out and you can listen and you can participate and you can think for yourself. But when you talk about liberals or conservatives, by default you make mistakes because everybody falls under, under the... The one umbrella. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Everybody falls under the same umbrella because those are the only two concepts that get used in the debate that goes on out there. So there is a responsibility that you have. What's that like, Ward? <laughs> There's a responsibility that you have as a young person and as a citizen in this country. So if somebody, some adult is saying, I'm a liberal, I'm a Democrat, then you better understand what you're talking about. Because if you can't explain yourself, then I'm putting you under the same umbrella with people like the Clintons and the Careys and those people that I definitely disagree about. Philosophically, I disagree <coughs> with them. And why is that important? We talk about communities, we talk about society, we talk about families. What makes those up? People, individuals. Government and politics doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's comprised of the people that make it up. And not just for the head count that makes up the census. Government doesn't mean anything to any other beings except the human beings who embody it. I mean, I had a bulldog map. I thought he was almost human. But government doesn't mean anything to him. It doesn't mean anything at all. And government won't work unless people do. Not work as in 9 to 5 or remain regularly employed, but operate their lives. Work in the sense that they operate their lives by an effective philosophy of life. Ayn Rand was a brilliant woman. And I happen to believe that we all have different thumbprints, DNA, whatever you want to use, to illustrate it that makes us, gives us a different purpose in our life. And Ayn Rand certainly had a purpose. But she said this about philosophy. As a human being, you have no choice about the fact that you need a philosophy. Your only choice is whether you define your philosophy by a conscious, rational, disciplined process of thought, or let your subconscious accumulate a junk heap of unwarranted conclusions, false generalizations, undefined contradictions, undigested slogans, unidentified wishes, doubts, and fears, all thrown together by chance, but integrated by your subconscious into a kind of mongrel philosophy. Different than you may have thought or had planted in your head through osmosis or academic osmosis, philosophy is not some high and mighty abstract diversion created only by degree philosophers to leave the rest of us human beings confused. It's neither rocket science or voodoo, it's like concrete. Born, you will acquire philosophy of life, and you will live by it. It is simply your comprehensive view on whether or not you believe that you are capable of dealing with existence around you. And whatever your belief is determines how you will think and act day in and day out here on this planet. And if government depends on its people, if government, society, families, communities, neighborhoods are made up of the individual people, government is made up of people, how can we discuss societal solutions if we first don't take into account what kind of philosophy of life people have and how they think and act to begin with? Because let's be honest with one another. There are plenty of people, some of you know people, who live by a mongrel philosophy of life. They're winging it. They don't have a clue. Day by day, it changes for them. Whatever works. They don't think about the consequences. They just go on. They make their choices on that basis. What works for me immediately now? There are no long-term goals, no long-range goals. Well, America is an idea. 
It's not the sea, the shining sea. It's not the land mass, north to south, or east to west. No, it's the greatest idea mankind has ever known. Created, accepted, and seconded by some of the greatest people. Some of the greatest people who ever walked the face of this planet. And its foundation is grounded in a philosophy, a distinct belief about what the lives of its people are and how capable they are as individuals to deal with their living. This country's philosophy precedes what it is governmentally. The Declaration of Independence is our philosophical statement. The Constitution is our political statement, our governmental doctrine. Look, in case you never paid attention or you were ignorant, <coughs> ignorant not being a bad thing all by itself, it's not wicked, it just means you don't have the information. And I've been blessed with the opportunity this evening to let you in on a few things. America's government is not a rough draft. It's not. It's still, after all these years, under construction, trying to find its way to being figured out. What America is, it has been for over 227 years. And at its core, it is to remain unchanged. Our republic form of government is already. Conservatism's or liberalism's political ideas, different than you may have picked up at your local cantina, cantina or here at your local political talk shows, are not mechanisms of creation, creating America. They are simply mechanisms of interpretation. To found this country, the founders didn't just pull crap out of thin, thin air 227 years ago. They took from the ideas, the mistakes, experiments, experiences, and traditions of a knowledgeable record of thousands of years of mankind's attempt at finding the most effective way to govern himself. Even Thomas Jefferson himself, when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, claimed that the founders and he were bringing forth nothing new. In his own words, this is what he said. It was not the object of the Declaration of Independence with respect to our rights to find out new principles or new arguments never before thought of, not merely to say things which had never been said before, but to place before mankind the common sense of the subject in terms so plain and firm as to command their assent and justify ourselves in the independent stand we were compelled to take. All its authority, Thomas Jefferson talking about the Declaration of Independence, and where its thread of thought came from, all its authority rests on the harmonizing sentiments of the day, whether expressed in conversation, in letters, in printed essays, or in the elementary books of public right, as Aristotle, Locke, Hobbes, Sidney, and Cicero, etc. Where did the knowledgeable record, what is that knowledgeable record of thousands of years? It's Western civilization. It's what we used to teach in the schools and we don't teach anymore. We cannot teach people to think and act like Americans if we don't teach America. Now I need to ask you, who in here knows of rights you can have, acquire or get someplace or get to use without there being a responsibility? Does anybody know where we can get some rights to do something without a responsibility? For instance, like you go home for the weekend or for a holiday, a school holiday, and you get to use something of your family's. You get the right to use it. Aren't you responsible for it? You come to school, you take classes. You have the right to go to school. You pay your tuition. You get signed up for the classes. Is there a responsibility that comes along with it? Does anybody know where they can get rights without responsibility? Life. That's probably your most fundamental responsibility. Is there a responsibility? To yourself. Or to who? What are the responsibilities that come with the right to life? Just no, a simple it's, one. You're, it's, you're born, you have a right to life when you're born. You don't, you don't have to do anything for it. Oh, you know? Who raised you? Who changed your shitty diapers? <laughs> who fed you? Who stuck, who stuck the nip on your mouth? As a baby, as a baby, what was my responsibility to my parents before my right to life? What did I have to do to earn my right to life? 
Life to right includes the inherent responsibility by somebody. You don't have any responsibility? As a child, as a baby, what do you have to do to earn your right to life? I didn't say earn your right to life. It's you have your life. No, it doesn't make sense at all. Somebody has a responsibility of sustaining your life. There's a responsibility. You have to pay it back later. No, 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 no. No, no, the question was, is there a right? Are there any rights without a responsibility? Did I say you? I say any right. Any right. Any right. Is there any right you know of without a responsibility? Responsibility to find half. There are no rights. No, the guy you did, did he on it? <laughs> there are no rights. You have a right to life, okay? If somebody, okay, so if nobody does anything to sustain that life, if they drop the responsibility, no, you're turning into something I didn't ask. I said, do you know of any rights? Your life, your your life when you were born, depended on that adults would act responsible to keep that life right alive. I didn't say in my question to anybody, do you know of a right you can have without your own individual responsibility? There is no right. There's, the question was, do you know of a right without responsibility? Water. Is there a right? <laughs> what are you smoking? <laughs> There are any. There are no rights without responsibility. Beautiful. <laughs> Same give and take. Rather, the give and protect applies to every one of you as a citizen of this country. Protection of one's unalienable right without the assumption of self responsibility absurd is absurd. Yet it's an absurdity that we tolerate every day. Now I'm a conservative, and I somewhat explained that before we started this evening. I'm a conservative who defines it very simply. And I start with preserving traditions that have worked throughout time, beginning with the simple idea that people need to think and they need to provide for themselves. But it's been my experience since I've been involved, paying attention and doing this self-study to see what's going on. There are a group who call themselves Liberals who want to sidestep the responsibility that comes with the protected unalienable right. Who in here would like to take a crack at telling me what they think the fundamental difference is? Hey, look, I'm good with it, man. You want to participate, but with me, there's a right and a wrong. You're entitled to your wrong opinion about things. <laughs> Mulberry bush round and round and round saying your opinion is just as valid as mine. If my if you're if I'm wrong and you correct me, I will defer and I will say I was wrong. Now I'm gonna take the right, I'm gonna have the right idea about it because you straightened me out. But in a lot of things that I'm gonna talk about here as we go along, my opinion is right. There is a right opinion. There are right ideas about how the world works. Liberals have a tendency to think that that's not the case, that every idea is just as legitimate as every other. Who would like to take a crack at telling me what to think the fundamental difference is today? Simply. I'm a simple guy, man. I stick with the basics. The difference between what? Conservatism and liberalism, the fundamental idea. Big man. Conservatism, there are absolutes. Absolute moral, absolute right and wrong on every single issue. Liberalism is entirely a gray area, simply stated. That's a good one, but I'm looking for something simpler. Back there, the white. Um, well, liberals believe that the government that the people elect has a responsibility to take care of them, whereas conservatives just kind what of... What country you live in? Stuff. What? What country you live in? 
What are you doing here? <laughs> Somebody else. No, that's not it. Thanks, so. though. Thanks, so. That's not the end. <laughs> why is she wrong? Yeah, why is she wrong? Well, because I'm looking for the right end. Because this is an socialist country. No, to entertain your question, and you can raise it later, this is not a socialist country. You know, like, no, our government isn't about giving handouts to people and taking care of people if they can't take care of them. Right here. Right here. That's not exactly yes, right here, in New York. Um, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of ignorant ideas in both parties, and um, I think that today, conservatives, conservatism is part of. You hear of my question? Conservatism is a party of bad ideas, and liberalism is a party of no ideas. That's the answer I was looking for. Left. That's the answer I was looking for. I think that's true. Okay, I'm sorry. The fundamental difference between conservatism, the fundamental difference between conservatism and liberalism is thinking versus feeling. Thinking versus feeling. To run individuals' lives and to run society at large. To use head over heart, to analyze and problem solve. Thinking versus feeling. Liberalism in a nutshell. Is a whining and complaining, contradictory and hypocritical thinking and acting in the hope of no repercussions yeah. and the expectation that they can depend, the expectation that they can depend on someone not only to provide them with their sustenance for life, honey, but their outcome, their happiness overall. Ignorance, stupidity, and dependence are qualifiers for being a modern-day liberal. Truth is, liberalism has done with all concepts, as they have even done with their own, in its classical definition, as they have done with feminism, equal rights, diversity, and a long line of other positively originated concepts. They've taken them all, and they've adulterated them, and they've poisonously twisted them into shameful euphemisms that mean anti-American, racism, fascism, and all kinds of hateful, quasi-criminal criminal behavior. In the classrooms across this country, minds are being trained to be anti-truth, anti-discipline, anti-virtue, anti-leader, anti-American. We are training minds in this country, in the schools across this nation, literally to be anti-mind. And this continued idiotic assault to turn rationality and reason upside down on its head and supplant feelings for thinking, so much so that every word of every concept and every act of every action no longer have any meaning, has compromised not only our republic but our humanity altogether into an abyss of moral relativity, where everything is just as legitimate as everything else, where there are no absolutes, no right or wrong, no true or false, no good or evil, no objective judgments, no objective analyses, the broadest and most despicable illustration of this most destructive consequence of moral relativity is that barbarism today is as legitimate as civilization. Nothing subject to moral relativity is left out between these two extremes. That the bum is as legitimate as the businessman. That homosexuals. Oh, Jesus. Homosexuality? You don't have an orgasm on me, honey. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let, me, let me phrase this correctly. Let me come down off my politically correct horse. <laughs> that, that queers are as legitimate as heterosexuals? How are they not? That the anarchists, because queering doesn't make the world work. I got a guy here shooting a biography of my life. I would let go. Let's get him videotaping you hooking up and let's wait nine months and see if there's a baby. I 
don't care if you kiss another man, you can do it right here. <laughs> And you can get better quality reality TV if you go home. Okay. What's wrong with homosexuality? Hey, look, man, I have told Answer the fucking you. Answer question. Answer the question. Oh, I just told you, queering doesn't make the world work. You're in comfort before me. Justify that. Homosexuality what the fuck is, you is not smoking? as legitimate as heterosexuality. On what ground? What are you talking about? Let me tell you why. Here's the reason why. Let me tell you the reason why. doesn't work that way. Reality. Reality. Does that work for you? Reality? Then how does history work? Reality? You're, what does that have to do with you're, you're thinking homosexuality is offensive? Say reality a couple times. I got another good one for you. I got another good one for you. That Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa. Is just as legitimate as Santa Claus and Christmas. <laughs> that a terrorist is just as legitimate as one of this country's revolution freedom fighters. That Tony Morrison is just as legitimate as Thomas Jefferson. That Yasser Arafat is just as legitimate as George W. We are a society that pathetically, even pathologically, praises vice over virtue in every degree. Absolute, absolute. There's a war going on in this country. There's a war going on, right? But it's going on in this country inside to a border. The idea America is at stake. Conservatism and liberalism are fighting to drive America by their respective philosophy. Liberals believe in a utopian society where everything is equal. Nobody is or has any less than anybody else, and we all have equal quantities of everything top to bottom. Life doesn't work that way. It's a good for nothing joke that it can, and worse, an oppressive, evil fraud to then pursue it as a goal. Like a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. A societal liberal leveling will make our society only as good as its least critical, its laziest, its most timid, least educated, least motivated, most beggarly, and most insipidly inspired among us. It is liberals' intent only to win for liberalism as a cause. That's it. To have its dreamy cause prevail as another ism in a long line of other historically failed isms. Like Marxism, communism, Stalinism, socialism. Ever since LDR turned opportunity to the right and they became encroaching entitlements, thereby adulterating true classical liberalism. This is a good line. You're going to want to hear it. The only thing created by liberalism thus far is the road paved to hell with good intentions. Now, 15 years from now, don't let the tin cup I kick hit you in the mouth and knock your teeth out. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, I have a question and you can participate. You can participate in the question. Is it on? Yep. Does it sound like it? Is it on? Okay. Okay, how many of you ever have ever belonged to a club? Let's say a non pornographic club. <laughs> or made packs with your fridge and held it as something something that you needed to uphold. How many of you have ever been part of the club? Go back to when you were a kid or anything. You okay? Look, let's just count. <laughs> this wrestling counter is not just softcore porn. Okay, how many of you know the oath of naturalization? How many of you know the oath of naturalization? All you anti-Americans. Up there. Okay, here it is. This is what somebody has to say to be sworn in as an American citizen. I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen. That I will support and defend the Constitution and its laws of the United States of America against enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true allegiance to the same. That I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by law. That I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by law. That I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by law. And that I take this free, this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of invasion. So help me God. Now, that's what somebody that wants to become an American citizen has to take. I can't imagine that those of us that are naturally born here and are American, state, American citizens that way have to pledge any less allegiance than what the oath of naturalization says. I mean, what about, I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince potentate. What about, I will suspend, support, and defend the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America. What is it that people don't understand? It's as simple as asking somebody, what don't you understand about yes or no? People, cultures, and civilizations are not equal. America is a superior culture and civilization to all others since the beginning of time. I'm here. Facts are, facts are too many of us. Facts are. One fact. I understand. Okay, now I'm going to speak to those of you that uh, are paying attention here. Facts are. Too many of us, too many of us are using human as an excuse and not an empowerment. So much so. Using what you are. What do you think unalienable right refers to in the Declaration of Independence? One that don't require responsibilities. <laughs> no. don't, don't worry, brother. In these modern times, somebody will pick up your slack. Yes, Alred? You know, you don't go on. This is, I will say this, I say this next to those of you who are of a conservative mind, are paying attention to what's going on, not the idiots back there living in Tim City. Yeah! <laughs> All you guys, forget what it means to be an American. Look, you're not going to deter me. Being American okay. This is what I want to tell you. Well, my 44 years of life experience have taught me the path of least resistance is not living, it is dying. And it is not what our Creator intended for us to do. We are not built the way we are as the human beings we are, as the rational animals, as the kings of the animal kingdoms. We are not built to come here and squander. Contrary to what liberalism perpetuates and defends, Acting all a human is not too hard. We're Being the best of human is not way out of line. Human as a standard is not too high. 
It is attainable. It is the goal that you should set for yourself. You are at an age, whether you've been mentored properly or not, where it is time to get your human, your human responsibility act together. Horace Mann, this country's first education secretary, said, be ashamed to die until you have won a victory for humanity. Well, I'm here to tell you, in the debate that goes back and forth between conservatism and liberalism, about who needs to give up what, who needs to contribute to what, for those of us that have done better, how much we give back to those that have not. There is no greater victory to win for humanity. None. As conservatives and Republicans and Americans pay attention, if you never paid attention, there is no greater victory to win for humanity than actualize all of your human potential. Your greatest asset to contribute to the world you want to live in, your greatest asset is what you are. And wherever you find yourself in your life, wherever you find yourself in your life, 10, 15, 20, 25 years from now, what you are is the greatest thing that you have to contribute. Wherever you find yourself, there's no greater impact than you can make to affect the kind of world you want to live in than to adhere to this practice. An example set is an example learned. Always. Of all the things you cannot control, you must control yourself. Don't fall for the lie. Don't fall for the lie that there are two sides to every issue making nobody either right or wrong. Both sides do not have equal moral validity. And the only winner to come out of a compromise between true and false is false. Right and wrong is wrong, and good and evil is evil. And I will remind every single one of you, as an American of this, of this country, as American citizen of this country, don't let your easy, carefree, comfortable lives fool you. You are entrusted with an inheritable responsibility, just as John Dickerson, signer of the, signer of the, deck, the Constitution, pointed out. Honor, justice, and humanity call upon us to hold and to transmit to our posterity that liberty which we received from our ancestors. It is not our duty to leave wealth to our children, but it is our duty to leave liberty to them. No infamy, inequity, or cruelty can exceed our own if we, born and educated in a country of freedom, surrender succeeding generations to a conditions of wretchedness. Are you going to think and act today? Is it the consequences of your choices? Are only going to affect this world 10, 20 minutes from now, 10 to 20 years from now? Or are you going to think and act and make your choices as if you know and believe that the consequences will affect this world 200, 300, 400 years from now? Ask yourself. Ask yourself. Liberals too. Ask yourself. Ask yourself what each one of the founding people did 227 years ago. When they couldn't go to the cities in the summertime because the horse shit created a poison and made thousands of people die. Thousands of people die. Ask yourself the question those people ask themselves. Will I do, will I do, will I do in my life what will last forever? Will you do with your life? Will you have the courage, the discipline to do with your life? Ask yourselves that tonight. Will I do with and in my life? what will live forever. Oh, you're right here in the front row. Very places I know. Will you? That's the question that you need to ask yourself that drives you in everything you do. All the choices that you